and he focuses on computational modeling of cognitive processes. His main interest include deep learning, recurrent neural networks, and probabilistic generative models, which are applied to investi investigate visual processing and attentional mechanisms. During his PhD, he developed a neurocomputational framework to simulate cognitive function based on supervised deep learning. Besides a primary interest in cognitive science, he works with computer scientists to improve the computational aspects of learning models. For example, by exploiting parallel computing architecture, GPUs, or by inventing novel learning algorithms. He also collaborates with electronic engineers to improve telecommunication technologies by optimizing wireless and underwater data transmission. So this is why I, I got to know him. And uh, he has been recently invited as instructor to the annual meeting of the Cognitive Science Society, where he discusses unsupervised modeling approach on a special workshop dedicated to deep learning. So in this talk, uh, Alberto is going to provide some um, main theoretical foundation of artificial neural network discussing both supervised and unsupervised forms of deep learning, and briefly also sequential architecture based on recurrent networks. Then we will provide examples and case studies related to a number of cognitive tasks, as well as their application on difficult optimization problems. Uh, in addition to that, there will be an hands-on session. Uh, if you have your laptop with you, Alberto will guide you through this and sound session to, to work on some of the models that he's presenting. And you will have also the opportunity to download the code from a site that will in, he will indicate. Okay? So we see whether we can do it also according to uh, what you have, if you have the, the software installed. Uh, I guess it's MATLAB that they need. Yeah, it's MATLAB, but uh, then if you want to try it at home, uh, we also have a Python implementation. So I would say two final words, and then I leave you with the speaker. Although he, he looks pretty young, this guy is going to rock you. So be, be prepared for that, OK? Thank you so much, Alberto. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Michele, and thanks to all the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I had a look to the, to the program of the conference and uh, of, the, of the school, and it really looked uh, very heterogeneous and interesting. So you had some. Uh, hints on machine learning, on kernel representation learning, on supervised or reinforcement learning, on Bayesian networks. So I hope that my talk will kind of complement the, the missing part maybe, which is mostly related to unsupervised learning. And I'll, I'll focus on artificial neural network models, in particular unsupervised deep learning models. But first I will also introduce some more general principles related to neural networks and probabilistic graphical models. As you can see, I'm coming from the department of uh, psychology. So every time somebody asks me about uh, fixing his computer or the internet connection is not working, I say, no, please, I'm a psychologist. So don't bother me with these technical questions. But if you have uh, psychological problems, I'm a computer scientist. So don't ask me also that. <laughs> OK, so my lecture will focus on first uh, basic ideas in neural networks. I don't know if you are already familiar with the neural networks, but I'll try to motivate the study of neural networks, sorry, first from a cognitive neuroscience perspective, but also from a machine learning perspective. Okay. I will just briefly introduce artificial neurons and then talk about more complex neural network architectures. And I will stress the importance of unsupervised learning, which is also called representation learning. I will then go into the theoretical and technical details. Uh, first, from a cognitive and neurocognitive perspective, I will introduce you the Bayesian brain hypothesis. The hypothesis that the brain is always acti actively interpreting its environment by creating hypotheses, probabilistic hypotheses. I will then go into the, some theory of an undirected graphical models, also known as Markov networks. These are kind of uh, the, the brothers of Bayesian networks that you have been hearing yesterday. I will then discuss how we can use Markov networks, for example, to model associative memory processes. 
in particular using neural networks called Boltzmann machines. And these models were invented almost 30 years ago, but they were almost completely neglected. Nobody was really interested in Boltzmann machines. Why? Because they were computationally too much complicated. Learning a Boltzmann machine required maybe days and days of computing. So people said, OK, we just use error back propagation, which is much faster, more efficient, but also supervised. If you want to do unsupervised, then Boltzmann machines are the right choice. And since uh, the last uh, 10, 15 years, recent progress in algorithms have made it possible to train Boltzmann machines in a much more efficient way. I will then try to give you some hints about how to combine multiple Boltzmann machines to build hierarchical generative models, also known as unsupervised deep learning. And I will also talk uh, about some extensions of Boltzmann machines to process sequential information. So if some of you have heard before about deep learning, I guess they, that you didn't hear about Boltzmann machines and sequential version of Boltzmann machines. Because usually everybody study convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks. These are the most famous models, which are trained using error back propagation. In this case, the learning algorithm is different, and also the theoretical framework is a bit different. I will try to convince you that these models are interesting by providing case studies from cognitive modeling and also briefly network optimization. And the last part of the talk will be a hands-on practice session. So if you have your laptops, you can use them. Uh, you need MATLAB, but as I said, you can also download Python code, but try it maybe uh, next time, because I, I will uh, follow some MATLAB commands to process the data. If you don't have your laptop, no worries. You can just follow what I'm doing in my, in my own, and then you can try later at home. So what is cognitive neuroscience? Because I'm always surprised people ask me, why are you studying cognitive neuroscience? You are a computer scientist. I say, yeah, but cognitive neuroscience is a field that is concerned with the study of the biological and physical mechanisms which underline the mind, cognitive functions. In particular, focusing on the neural processes. Okay. So if, for in the one hand of the bridge, we have mental phenomena like a perception, attention, high-level reasoning, language, emotional control, all these things which are usually studied by psychology, by linguistics, sociology, anthropology. So it's like if one side of the bridge is concerned with abstract things, the mind as something which is really uh, not physical at all. On the other side of the bridge, we have a physical phenomena. We have uh, molecules, we have atoms, we have uh, transmission of synaptic pulses into neurons. Uh, we have uh, synaptic processes, which are very complicated uh, biochemical processes. We have uh, cells, we have uh, genes, all these physical things, which are usually studied by physics, chemistry, biology, neuroscience, so the hard sciences. But there's a gap. How is it possible that we have mental things, abstract things, studied by psychologists, and also physical things? Are they related some way? So this question is answered by cognitive neuroscience, trying to make a bridge between the physical phenomena and the mental abstract phenomena. Okay. Also, some other disciplines are trying to make this bridge. But since this is a scientific school, I will only talk about cognitive neuroscience. Why we are interested in machine learning as cognitive neuroscientists? Well, machine learning are adaptive system that can improve performance based on experience. So they learn and they change their own structure. Okay? So this is exactly what is believed to be the, the root of learning and memory in biological agents, in humans, for example. And machine learning is, of course, concerned also with uh, the more theoretical fields of uh, nonlinear optimization or with data mining, pattern recognition, self-organization in 
in general in complex systems. But it's very important for cognitive neuroscience because it provides a way to discuss and study the mechanisms, the physical processes, which can give rise to complex cognitive abilities, which we define as thought. Okay. So there's a very fruitful and intricate relationship between cognitive neuroscience and machine learning. I think that we cannot understand the human brain if we cannot build a machine which behaves like a human. And in a similar way, for building such a machine, I guess we should also better understand our own mind, our own machine, our own brain. Okay. So this is basically why I think a computer scientist and psychologists and neuroscientists and physicists and engineers should really work all together to understand the complexities of the mind and the brain. But now let's go to neural networks, which is the central topic of my lecture. The basic building block of a neural network is the so-called artificial neuron. It is a non-linear device we also have linear artificial neurons, but they are less interesting, less powerful. So I will focus on nonlinear artificial neurons. They just collect input signals, like biological neurons do. They perform a weighted sum of the signals, and then they fire according to some threshold. I can draw a scheme. So we have inputs here. These might be inputs from sensory systems, like a retina, cochlea for auditory systems or some sense touch sensors. Or they can be input from other neurons in the network. Okay? We have a set of weights. These are called synaptic weights or connection weights, which are the parameter of the model, as we will see. We multiply each input for each weight. This way we obtain a summed, uh, weighted sum of the input which is passed through the, the cell, the, the real body of the neuron, which has a threshold function. This is why it is a nonlinear device. This is a sigmoid activation function, but we might have a step function, like a heavy side function. And the output is therefore the weighted sum given as input to this nonlinear activation function. Okay. So this is a fairly simple device. Okay. But since it is nonlinear, it can do very amazing things. Okay. Something that I want you to note is that these weights are very important. Because if we change them, we change the behavior of the neuron. Okay? So imagine that we increase this weight, then the whole sum will change. Maybe we go above a threshold and the neuron will fire. Okay? So it's important the fine tuning of each weight because they all contribute to the final behavior of the neuron. So in another, in, say in another words, these are the parameters of the model. Okay? If we fit these parameters to the data, we can learn interesting things, okay? for example. As I just said, learning is the change of a connection weights. How can we perform learning? We can just perform it by gradient descent. We need to define a error function, which is parameterized of the connection weights. And then we try to minimize the error function, for example. Okay. So maybe the neuron must predict 0 or 1. Maybe it's a binary neuron. If it predicts 1 and the target was 0, that's an error. So we try to change the connection weights in such a way that the next time he will give the correct answer. Okay. So we can do gradient descent which is a powerful optimization technique, and change these ways accordingly. Um, something that I don't want to go into the details is that this is a non-linear, non but it's also a continuous function, like a sigmoid. This way we can perform gradient descent. If we have a threshold function, like a heavy side function, it's much e uh, mo more harder to, to perform gradient descent. We cannot differentiate the function easily. So for the moment, we just consider continuous functions. Then what we do, we create neural networks by stacking together, by combining many artificial neurons. Okay? So we still have the input data. Then we have a, a set of 
artificial neurons, which are called hidden neurons, for example, and we call W1 the whole connection matrix. So we don't have now just one vector of weights, we have a matrix of connection weights. And then we might have another matrix of connection weights which pr project these activations to a set of output neurons. Okay. This is the most common and famous neural network arch architecture. We will see that there are many variants and different ones. Still, learning can be performed by gradient descent. So we have an error function like this. We have a desired target. We have the output of the network. We take the difference. We can square it, OK, like a mean square error, for example. And we try to descend this function in order to minimize it. This way, we can change these two connection matrices in order to achieve the desired behavior of the network. We should note that since these are nonlinear neurons, this is a non-convex optimization problem, very hard problem. But we have practical algorithms like error back propagation, which work pretty well, well and can minimize the function uh, in a reasonable time. Just, uh, I want just to mention that this type of models have been shown to be universal function approximators. So you see there's an input-output mapping. So this is like basically a function. We, have a, we are specifying one input and the desired output. And by providing enough hidden units, we can approximate any function. So these are very powerful algorithms. Okay. And similarly, other types of models, which are unsupervised, as we will see in a while, have been shown to be universal approximators of discrete distributions in the input. So this is was just to say that neural networks are very, very powerful. They can be considered theoretically to be able to abstract almost any function. Of course, this is in theory. Then in practice, you have to run an algorithm which might take maybe 1,000 years to approximate the function. But that's another uh, problem. Okay. We can create many different types of network architectures. Okay. And the, impo the important thing is that the network topology, so the way the neurons are connected, if they have directed errors or undirected ones, if they have recurrent projections, these different architectures define different computational properties of the system. So the most simple one, it's a network with uh, only one layer of input unit, one layer of output units. This is usually can be approximated using a linear system. So it's a pretty easy linear associator. If we add a set of hidden neurons, this is a much more powerful device, which have been shown, for example, to approximate any function. If we add the recurrent connections, so you see there's a layer of neurons, which we call the context layer, we can also store temporarily information, and we can process, for example, sequences Okay, because the flow of the information is not just input, hidden, output. It's also going back to some memory cells, which are then contributing at the next time step to the computation. So this network is much more powerful than this because it can process time sequences. Okay. This one is also a different architecture. I will focus on these architectures on the uh, upper side of the, of the panel. It's an undirected model. There are no arrows, you see. So this is um, kind of more interesting from a bio biological point, point of view. It's a, it's a network that can solve constraint satis uh, satisfaction problems. And we will see in a while why they are interesting for cognitive science. So in the 1986, two psychologists and also their research group called the Parallel Distributed Processing Group, wrote a book that has been considered the Bible of modern cognitive science. Basically, they were proposing that mental phenomena can emerge from physical phenomena by using these simple neural networks as a toy models to ground their theory. So Rumelart and McClelland were taking inspiration from 
machine learning and computer science and physics models, and they were saying to all the psychologists, well, maybe mental phenomena, cognition, thinking, is something that is just derived, emerging from complex physical phenomena, like those instantiated in artificial neural networks. So their theory was in sharp contrast with the symbolic approach. I don't have time to go into the details of this hot debate, but for example, Chomsky, Newell, Simon, in the 50s, 60s, they were proposing that the mind is not at all concerned with the brain. It's just a symbolic processing machine. This framework is much more different, okay? It's based on um, the concept of emergence, okay? The basic ideas, well, there are neural as assemblies. Keep in mind that this might not be just a single neuron in the brain. It might be like a group of neurons contributing to the same function, okay? Simple nonlinear processing units, which are forming interconnected networks, okay? What is knowledge? human knowledge, it's implicitly encoded in the strength of synaptic connections. So knowledge is not stored in uh, symbolic forms, in uh, logic forms, it's just stored in the synaptic connections of a neural network. Okay. What is learning, what is development, is the gradual change of the connection strength according to some optimization criteria. Okay. So maybe during our life, the optimization is to gain information, to gain uh, expert knowledge. So we change the synaptic connections of our neurons in such a way to optimize uh, this type of tasks. Then what's an active representation, what the psychologists will call an idea, is just the pattern of distributed neuronal activations occurring, for example, in the hidden neurons. So we see a picture and our neurons some way fire into a distributed pattern of activation. That is the representation of that picture. In conclusion, what is cognition according to this framework? It's the physical evolution over time of such a complex dynamical system. Okay. So for you, this might be like uh, easy and say, okay, yeah, of course, cognition is like this. But 30 years ago, it was not like that. People were saying that cognition is something completely different, like syntactic manipulation of symbolic structures. This is a pretty different framework. But now we go back to machine learning because I don't want to discuss cognitive neuroscience for the whole lecture, okay? So I tried to summarize the three major learning frameworks uh, according to machine learning. The first one is supervised learning, which is sometimes called classification, categorization, function approximation, regression. These are all supervised settings. Okay? We assume that a teaching signal, which we call supervision, is always available when we want to learn. Okay? So the agent is trying to perform a task, he gives an answer, and the teacher say, yes, this is the correct answer, or no, that is the correct answer, okay? It is a very powerful way for learning complex tasks, but it is quite implausible cognitively and biologically, because we know that the kids, or even yourself, are not learning by always explicit supervision. The kid is just going around, trying things, uh, observing, it's not that, the mom is always there, this is a bottle, this is a computer, this is a microphone. The kid is exploring just by itself, right? So from a cognitive perspective, supervised learning is not really what's happening in the human brain. Also, if you want, from an engineering perspective, supervised learning might be powerful, but we need supervision for everything, which is not always available in the real world uh, applications. Unsupervised learning, I think it's much more interesting. It's sometimes called representation learning, feature extraction, clustering, dimensionality reduction. All these algorithms try to discover regularities of the environment by only observing. Okay? So no supervision, no teaching signal. In this way, cognition is conceived as a model building process. We try to build a model of the environment. 
Finally, another very interesting setting is the reinforcement learning setting. Here we can also learn control poli policies. Psychologists call them executive functions. Everything that is considered with decision making. Yes, please. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, I hope you know scaffolding. Yeah. Uh, where does it fall between the two, unsupervised learning or? Mm. Try, try to elaborate what you mean by scaffolding, okay. okay. What I mean, they use scaffolding for learning the behavior of a different system. It's more like you accumulate knowledge, like you say a baby, you accumulate knowledge as you grow, mm -hmm. but after some time you don't need help to be taught something. Then you use the experience that you have accumulated to do everything. So my question is, what does that force between I think that falls in all of them, because all these frameworks are letting you to build knowledge in different ways, but you are building internal knowledge, which can be used for subsequent learning. So it's like you are accumulating always knowledge. You can use all of them together also. I mean, I guess that the baby is using all of them. So it's like building its own knowledge base, knowledge structure, which is used then actively during learning, yeah. Okay. So I think uh, in humans, but also in, in intelligent machines, we should use all of them. I'm not claiming that one is the, the right choice, okay. But what I'm saying is that maybe supervised learning is the most popular framework and it's probably the less used in biological systems, okay? In reinforcement learning, instead, we can interact with the environment. So it's very similar to unsupervised learning because we, are, we don't need a supervisor, but it's very different at the same time because we can manipulate the environment. We see something, maybe I, I look uh, at uh, some objects. If unsupervised learning is just estimating what the ob object might be. Reinforcement learning say, no, pick it up. You pick it, you rotate it, you can manipulate it in order to gain more information. Or you can try to drink it to see the effect. So you, you can also take actions on the environment. This is why reinforcement learning probably is the one which is cognitively more uh, plausible, okay? Babies are doing this all the time. But it is also computationally very demanding. So reinforcement learning is pretty hard to implement on machines. Okay. So in my talk, I will focus on unsupervised learning. Um, but also, I will discuss some supervised learning which can be combined with unsupervised learning. Okay. But let me give you an example. Uh, I'm sorry if you are just fam already familiar. It's easy for you. but. If you are not familiar with machine learning, it's good to reiterate this. So we have a cognitive agent, a robot, a kid, a human, an adult human, an animal. The agent is seeing something new. This is a, like a percep the perception of something. Okay? In a supervised learning context, he's saying, oh, this is a, maybe a lizard. And the teacher is saying, no, little robot, that is a spider. So the teacher is activating the correct category. This is the label that the teacher is giving as a supervision. In an unsupervised setting, the agent is saying, oh, I've seen something similar before. It has eight legs. It is small. It is brown. I guess it can also move. Okay. So this is like uh, putting the new concept in relation to other concepts that you have been experiencing before. This is the feature extraction problem. problem. You are counting the legs, you are looking at the size, you are looking at the color, you are extracting features from the inf perceptual information, and you are trying to relate these features to other features that you know, okay? And you can also make predictions this way. You can bet. It can move, probably, because it's similar to this guy, and it's similar to this guy. And they both move, so this one should also be able to move. So this is unsupervised learning. Reinforcement learning, you touch it. It's interesting. Mm, I touch it. Ooh, it beat me. It's painful. Okay. 
So you touch it, you get a feedback, and you run away, okay? You decide the correct action. So you don't eat it, you don't say hello, you run away, because your experience, your direct feedback is informing you about the correct action to take, okay? Again, why do we like unsupervised learning? Well, as I said, learning does not require any labels, okay? We can just use raw information. We look around the world and we try to understand it by discovering hidden patterns. Okay. Moreover, once we have built an internal model of the environment, so we have extracted some useful features or representations, then we can use it, for example, to learn supervised tasks or to transfer knowledge across similar domains. I will discuss this later on. As I said, from a psychological perspective, probably children and animals mostly exploit this learning modality during development, along with the reinforcement learning, of course. And we can also implement unsupervised learning using biologically plausible learning rules, okay? And also neural network architectures. So I don't have time for going into the details of this, but Donald Hebb was a famous uh, neuro, neuroscientist Actually, he was, a, I guess, a, more a, into the physiology of animals. And later, in the 1950s, he was proposing the Heb, Hebbian learning principles, which might be instantiated in the brain. And actually, unsupervised learning fits well with these principles. Of course, unsupervised learning also has major shortcomings. We don't know which features will be useful. So we have to extract features. but which features, okay? Maybe we are extracting features that are not useful to do something later. What constitutes a good representation? This is a challenging question. Okay. Also, sometimes for unsupervised learning, we, ha we need a lot, lot of data, okay? Computationally, it's pretty demanding. Sometimes we have uh, somebody with better experience, like a teacher, which can help us. So supervised learning is useful, especially if we have a teaching system, okay, like in human society. You don't have to learn from scratch everything because some people have discovered before you something and can communicate to you the correct category. So supervised learning is also very important. Finally, another big point. By just observing, we cannot infer causal structure. And this is a this goes into also philosophical <laughs> debates, but I don't want to discuss it. But by only observing, we cannot establish if something is likely to be the cause or the effect of something else. So I don't know if with the Bayesian networks you've been hearing about uh, causal models, but this is something you need to interact with the perceptual environment to establish causal structure. Let me give you another example to make sure you get the point. We want to perform a supervised mapping, and we have this raw data. I tell you, this is class one example, this is class one, this is class one, this is class two, class two, class two. I've been training you with six examples. Everybody, every example had a class, okay? Now you know there are two classes, and I ask you, which class is this one? So how many of you think class one? It's easy, it's easy. Okay, how many of you think class two? Nobody, okay. Good, this was easy, class one. But maybe before we could have extracted some useful features to build a higher level representation. For example, this guy is red, it has six angles, it is big, Etc. Etc. This other guy, it is red, it has three angles, it is big, blah, blah. So for all the figures, we are making explicit the features which can be used to describe them, okay? And if I ask you later which class is this one, you immediately see that the red is the feature which is in, in common, okay, between the uh, examples and the class, the, the target example, okay? So if we make explicit the features, 
it, it is easier to perform a supervised classification. So building these representations, it's what unsupervised learning is trying to do. Okay. Now, another example. I give you six training examples, class one, class two, and I ask you, which class is this one? I let you five seconds for extracting features. How many of you say class one? Nobody. How many class two? Good uh, feature extraction process. So if we extract uh, the features, you will see this is blue, six angle big, convex. This is red, three angle big, convex, blah, 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 blah. When I show you this one, you immediately say, see that the concave feature is common only um, uh, among these examples, but not among these examples. So this is a simple example to show you why unsupervised learning of features might be useful also for establishing supervised classifications. Okay. <clears throat> what are the limitations of uh, the neural networks that I've been discussing so far, like this? They are strictly feed-forward. The information is coming from here, goes up here in the hidden layer, and up here in the output layer. Okay. There is no feedback, no top-down effects. Okay. Learning must be supervised. Input, output, we compare the output with the correct label, and we learn in this way a discriminative model. We always need labeled training data. Okay. This architecture is also shallow. It has only one hidden layer. It cannot compl learn complex hierarchical features, as we will see later. And finally, up to some years ago, we could only build very small simulations, like neural networks with hundreds of neurons. In the brain, there are 10 billion of neurons or something like that. So these two problems have been solved by deep learning. Convolutional neural networks, we can train very big convolutional neural network and very deep convolutional neural networks. So when you hear people talking about deep learning, they are proud because they solved these two problems, which were big problems. But still, these two problems are present in most of the deep learning architectures, the convolutional neural networks. They need labeled data, error back propagation, and they process information in a feed-forward way. If we add recurrent connections, we can process also temporal dimensions, but it's harder with convolutional networks. So very briefly, from a psychological perspective, the brain is not just waiting for an input and then giving an output, like a feed-forward network. The brain is active. It's trying to infer the latent structure of the environment every time. If I show you some partial information, the brain can complete it. If I show you an ambiguous input, the brain can give different interpretations okay, based on top-down active mechanisms. If I give you a noisy image, the brain can complete the missing information and try to, for example, discover that there's a dog here sniffing on the street, there's a tree here. So the brain is able to do inference on what is missing in the input information. Or another famous example, I give you an occluded letter. You can guess that this is a K, because work, it's an English word, while war is not an English word. So the brain, with top-down mechanisms, is trying to infer the missing parts of the information. I can give you a scrambled sequence of letter. You cannot follow what's written. But I give you context, and you will understand, yeah, this is important. Okay. So you use top-down context to disambiguate the input. There are many examples. You can see flowers, but you can perceive a face. You can enter a, your black room without turning off the light, on the light. You can navigate. You can move. You can go to, to bed without having input. So the brain is actively guessing the input. Okay. 
And even when something goes wrong in the brain, like with some psychiatric syndromes, you can have uh, visual hallucinations, which really looks like real images. So people with some lesions in the primary visual cortex or in the higher visual cortex, they can experience vivid hallucinations. They really perceive that there's a bird there or there's a car, even if there's nothing. It's the brain which is actively guessing, completing the missing information. Also, for example, in schizophrenia, this is another psychiatric syndrome, you hear voices which are not there. So the auditory stream is completely silent, but you hear voices because the brain can actively create his own sensory information. So according to the active brain perspective, this model of the brain is not good. Input, processing, output. With reinforcement learning, you can have some feedback. So I take an, an output action, I change the environment. But still, it is not what the brain architecture is suggesting. In the brain architecture, we have a massive feedback connections. So we should also look at these red arrows, OK? For example, we have contextual top-down influences. We have bidirectional interactive activation of the neural networks. We can have intrinsic brain activity. This is a popular topic now in neuroscience, the so-called resting states. If I take you and I put you in a fMRI uh, scanner for doing a, a magnetic resonance, you close your eyes and I record your brain activity. The brain is crazily doing many things always. Top down, uh, actively trying to generate images, uh, produce thinking, thoughts, uh, visual, uh, um, sensory information. So the, the brain is not that all, only waiting for an input. It's also generating its own inputs. This is also used to do uh, anticipation of sensory information. You can predict the sensory stream in this way. But how to predict the environment? How can we be mm, proactive on predicting the environment? For example, by learning an internal model of the environment. And I will show you that we can do it in an unsupervised and probabilistic way using some powerful types of neural networks. Again, the last um, slides, on, slides on the cognitive perspective. The Bayesian brain conceives, therefore, the brain, the cerebral cortex, as a statistical inference and gene. So we have a sensory stimulus and we try to infer what is the most probable interpretation of such input information. Thomas Bias, back in the day, was saying, given some possibly noisy and incomplete evidence, what is the best hypothesis that can make sense of it? So also yesterday you've been hearing about Bayesian networks. You try to infer hypotheses over some incomplete or noisy or um, yeah, noisy information. Helmholtz, some centuries uh, later, was asking, given some possibly noisy and incomplete sensory information, what is its more probable interpretation? So Helmholtz was really proposing that the brain is a statistical inference and gene. Okay. And finally, Jeff Hinton said, oh, given some possibly noise and incomplete activation on the visible units of a Boltzmann machine, what is the most probable configuration of its hidden units? So you see all these questions can be reduced to the same problem. We have information, might be sensory information, might be other type of evidence, okay? And we want to estimate its hidden causes, the hypothesis that can explain such information. We can do it with uh, some neural networks, which are known as Boltzmann machines, as we will see in a while.